Hi, my name is Gerhard Schwantner and welcome to Sales Up Shop. Today we have the pleasure of meeting with Anthony Iannarino. Welcome, Anthony. Hey, Gerhard, good to see you again. So today we are going to answer questions from the audience and you've been kind enough to tweet us. Uh, the first question comes from Matt Hines. Can your sales rep have the business acumen they need to match their prospect's level of intelligence? Great question. I love that question and it's so important. I think there's two components to this in my mind. There's the business acumen and today what's changed in sales is you're actually going to help your client get a business result. So if you don't understand how their business works, how your business works, just general business principles, it's very hard to have that conversation. The second piece of that though is a little trickier. In my mind, I call it situational knowledge, and it's have you rubbed up against problems that look like this? Have you helped other other clients with challenges like the one that you're looking at now so that you've got the insights and the ideas and the experience that you can draw on to say, I've seen something that looks like this? And Gerhard, I know you're a salesperson, so this will resonate with you. At some point, you just start to intuit things like, oh, I've, I've seen this before, and this might be the right thing. And you may not always know why you can come to that conclusion at some point in the diagnosis, but you pick it up and you feel it. That's not easy for salespeople to get. It takes time, it takes coaching, it takes time going out on calls with other salespeople that have some situational knowledge and some experience that you don't have. But if you don't have it, you're not going to create value for your buyer and you end up wasting their time. Uh, do you have any recommendations for sales leaders and sales managers to coach salespeople in that art and science? But if you let a player that's new, that doesn't have that situational knowledge, go on calls with a more experienced salesperson, if they go on calls with a VP of sales or their sales manager or somebody who has that situational knowledge, you send them into those interactions with a direct command. And that command is, look, you're going on this call so that you can pick up the business ideas, the language that's being used to talk about those, and when you come back, we're going to ask you what you learned, what did you pick up, and you're going to write something down and share with us what you pick up from call to call. So it's their responsibility to pick it up. It's not enough for them to be a passenger and to sit along and smile while we make the sales call. They've got to take an active role in learning. After a sales call, there should be a debriefing where you ask the sales rep, uh, what do you think was good and why? But also, you need to ask, what would you improve and how? This, this is what a good coach does. The salesperson comes to you with a challenge, and instead of telling them what to do, you just ask them enough questions that they identify the part of them that already knows the answer or that can intuit what might be right. Th this is one of the biggest challenges, I think, for sales leaders and sales managers or leaders in any role. The object is not to create dependence, it's to create people that are independent and resourceful and who can take initiative. And the more you grow a group of people that can do that, the better your results are. But it's faster to just give them the answer, right? What should I do in this case? Here, I'll tell you what to do. Instead of saying, no, you need to think through this and come to your own conclusion, and then we'll talk about what you think the right answer is. Next question comes from Julie Durance, and she says, what is the biggest single thing you can do for a client to show that you care? There's not a biggest single thing. I'll go with two things in this case. The first is, if you sell something, you've got to execute on what you sell. You can't drop off what you sell at the door anymore and then go on to your next sale. You're responsible for that outcome. You're responsible for getting that result. So if you truly care, about helping your client, you've got to help them get the result completely. The second piece of that though is caring is something that has to be done proactively. It means that you do take initiative, you're thinking about your client and their challenges when they're not thinking about it, you're working on what's the next big idea that will drive their business through when they're not thinking about it and you continue to come back in and say, I can create more value, I can help us get an even better result than we're getting now. So I think it's a combination of two things, coming up with ideas and being very proactive about the relationship, and then making sure that you execute on what you sold. That reminds me of a quote by Mary Crowley who said that the customers don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think caring also 
comes with a different mindset. So if you are uh, convinced that you are there to create value for the customer, and if you have the confidence, it will shine through and the customer will trust you. Do you agree? I agree. And if you're completely self-oriented, that comes through as well. And if, if you're selling and it's all about you and getting the deal and making your commission check and it's all about you, they can feel that you don't care. It's very easy for people to, to perceive that based on the language you use and your behavior. If you're very uh, customer-oriented, they can feel that. If you're self-oriented, it's a complete violation of trust. Next question. Gina Kelly says, how do sales teams receive good, qualified, nurtured leads with key contact information included? They don't. Let's just be honest, they don't. They're not ready to buy. I know you want this lead that shows up and you're going to pick up the phone and you're going to say, I saw you downloaded our white paper. I'll send the contract over today. It's not going to happen. It just doesn't. I know we ask this. We get this question all the time. You're going to get a lead, and the lead's going to be somewhere in their, their buying cycle. They may just be exploring their needs at the very beginning. They may not know what they need. They're just looking for help figuring out should they be dissatisfied. Maybe you're getting them when they're resolving concerns. They've already talked to your competitors and they're just sort of taking a temperature to see what else is out there. You, you've got to, I'll use a golf analogy, you've got to play the ball where it lies. If it's not nurtured, you've got to do the nurturing. You've got to discover who else needs to be on that buying team. And I would love to tell you that there's this secret uh, stack of Glengarry Glen Ross leads that if you have those leads, you would make your number. But in the sooner... I think salespeople come to the realization it's your job to nurture those leads wherever they are in the cycle. The easier it is. Hey, here's the next question by Tim Mushy. Can you successfully take a hunter and transition to a farmer and vice versa? No, the answer is no. And the thing about hunters, they don't want to farm. The joy that they get of selling is taking something where there's no opportunity, creating something, selling it, and then dropping it off and moving on to the next one. And when you ask them to develop that relationship, stay with it, and manage the account, it's not in their DNA. For them, the joy is going on and hunting again. It's the same thing with farmers. There are great strategic account managers who can sell like the devil within an account that you give them after the account's already been won. But you ask them to prospect, and they, they will hate you for making them do that part of the sales role. They're great farmers, and they will develop lots of opportunities and grow your business, but they can't put on that hunter garb and go out and do that work. They're just not happy doing it. I think it's a mistake to mix them up. I think that there's a third category, uh, which I would call the trapper, the people who sell socially. So social selling is all about asynchronous communication with people that you don't know online. So if you practice social listening, and you set the questions right, questions really trap responses. And, and I think the trap is something that we need to learn a little bit more about because there are some people who do it very skillfully. What, what's your thought on that? I like it. I like it a lot. And I, I can see a lot of salespeople right now saying, that's me, I'm a trapper. I'm happy to skin the animal after it's been killed, but I don't want to be there when it gets killed. I'm happy to just set the trap and I'll come and check them later on uh, because they don't want to hunt. But I think you're right. There's something to that that you're describing is now there is this ability to not have to do too much hunting and let them come to you with inbound uh, marketing and all the tools that we have now that let you do that. You get to answer questions on Cura or LinkedIn. You've got a blog and people are connecting to you. And there's not so much of this proactive cold calling and asking that we have to do when we're hunters. I think there's a fourth category, which is let the prospect to the walking. So you hold events, many events where you educate your prospects in a group and you seat the group with uh, customers and prospects and uh, you unite them uh, through a conversation and you have a common theme that's important to everybody. So you're going now with fishermen, right? So we, we bait the traps in the net, and then we, we pull the net in. 
I like this. So I'm writing the Trapper blog post and the Fisherman blog post. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thanks, Gerhard.